plant pest diagnostic lab. Have you heard of us before? Yes, maybe some of you have. Some of you haven't. Well, you have a pen now, and that pen has our contact information. So you can just go to our website. Um, oh, I'm supposed to, did you hit the start record? Okay. <laughs> We're recording this. So this presentation will be on our website at some point. Um, it, it'll show the slides, and then it'll have my voiceover on it. So if you fall asleep an hour into this, you can go back and visit it later. Um, yeah, c concerning integrated pest management, I, w w what I do at the Utah Pest Lab is identify pests. And for instance, that thing that just went around, you know, in my opinion, I don't really see any pest of concern on there. There are four domestic house spiders, which are fine, um, not poisonous. There was one woodlouse spider. Those actually eat those little gray roly-poly bugs. So that's kind of a control method right there. There were two beetles that are kind of predaceous. So actually good to have around. And there was one of those silverfish-like things. Um, you know, th th those m may be bad, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Si right. And a millipede. I mean, you know, not so a big deal. Yeah, I, I'll talk about it. Actually, I'll talk about it during the identification section. So anyway, I, you know, I, in the lab, I've been there for about three and a half years. The first year, I didn't see a single bed bug. The next year, I had about four samples submitted. And then this year, I've had about eight. So even in my own little world, I, I've seen a, a doubling of, of insect samples or bed bug samples over the past few years. Um, so it is becoming a problem. But anyway... Yeah, I, I've given a, th this talk or a similar talk to pest control operators around the state. Uh, most recently to Deer Valley in Park City, and then again last Friday to the, the Park City Lodging Association, which covered all of the hotels and all the property managers in Park City. So, you know, they're jumping on board too, um, and they know it's becoming a problem. Again, here's our lab. Uh, we're actually, you know, comprised of a bunch of different people with different specializations. Um, Diane Alston, she's the other entomologist in our group, and she's been around for over 20 years. So she's super knowledgeable about pests, um, especially fruit pests and vegetable pests. Um, and then me, of course, we, we just hired these two people, a plant pathologist. So if you have plants or vegetables or whatever that you think might have a disease, you can send those to the lab. And it's $7 to have things identified. But we identify it, and then we tell you how to manage it, usually using an integrated pest management approach. Um, another entomologist, Marion Murray, our, our IPM project leader, she's really great. Um, she actually puts out uh, weekly publications in the summer that talk about the, the fruit pests, the vegetable pests, and the, the outdoor pests that we see. And, and she goes out and, and actually surveys for these different pests. So she'll say, what's out now? And here's what we're going to do about it. And she, she can tell you when exactly to implement your treatments, what you want to use. She'll also give you the least toxic options first, and then, you know, if necessary, the more toxic options. So that's a really great thing. You can sign up on our website for those, um, for those IPM advisories, and they'll come to your email automatically once a week. So that's a great thing to have. We, we don't have one for structural pests, um, but may, maybe that's something to consider in the future. And then finally, our CAPS coordinator. Okay, so if you go to our website, which is right here, utahpests.usu.edu, we have over 200 fact sheets on every pest of concern in Utah. Um, I, I did make two, new, two recent, well, in 2009, I made two fact sheets on bed bugs. And the things in the back were actually just one copy so everybody could see them. So maybe during the break, if you took things from the back desk there, maybe lay them back out so everybody can see them. Um, you can take them when you leave, but just so they're out. Um, the, the, the two, there's one for homeowners, and it mainly focuses on, on uh, teaching homeowners what they're up against and then how to select a pest control company. Because I never recommend that homeowners do this on their own because they're going to fail. Um, pretty certain of that. And then there's one for commercial or pest control managers um, and everything they need to know about bed bug biology and what's working and what's not working um, in the industry right now. So those are, you can find that on fact sheets or you can just Google bed bugs USU and you know, they'll come up there. And more recently, um, for, for the holidays, I actually, I came up with my travel tips. So my psychotic travel tips, I have them at the very end of this presentation, so we can go over it. But you'll see what I'm talking about. 
I'm kind of on the psychotic end of, of being paranoid of bed bugs. And the, the reason is, is um, when I first started, I made this presentation and I, I first gave it in Price, Utah. So I had all this bed bug knowledge going around in my head. I went down there, I stayed in a hotel, I went in, I immediately did my bed bug search. Everything's good, right? But, um, you know, in the early morning hours, I, I was scratching furiously and rolling around. And I kind of just went back to sleep. Um, but when I woke up, you know, kind of in a daze, I looked down at my pillow and I saw the, the fecal material from bed bugs. And I, you know, I, I knew that immediately. I was like, this is from bed bugs. And so I stood up, you know, I was all pumped up and I pulled the bed away from the wall and sure enough, there they were all over the back of the, the mattress, you know. So they were feeding on my face all night. But um, as an entomologist, I'm really, that gets me psyched up. So <laughs> I, I went in the bathroom, grabbed the glass and started collecting bed bugs and took it immediately down to the hotel manager and he grabbed the glass away very quickly and he's like, he's like, well, what do you want? I was like, I don't know, how about a discount, you know. He's, uh, so he gave me 10% off my stay. Thanks. But um, it's kind of scary. We, we actually, we went back up, you know, of course he's denying that they have a bed bug problem. But um, anyway, we went back up to the hotel room and we, we tore it apart. And, and where the eggs actually were, where the colony was hiding at that point was in between the box spring and the metal bed frame. So now my inspection is much more thorough. Yeah. Well, and that begs the question then. All right, and concerning stigmas, I mean, prevention is almost impossible. I mean, to keep bed bugs from coming in to a school or to a hotel, it's nearly impossible. So people have to understand that. And if, you know, we don't get new chemistries on the market and new techniques for treating bed bugs, you know, every hotel is going to have them at some point. So just get used to it. Um, if you want to be safe, then do the, you know, use my travel tips I'll give you at the end. So you might want to wake up for that. Um, anyway. So th this talk, a lot of it I got from this book right here, which was it's a little bit dated now because there's been so much research since 2007, but it's about $70, and it has summarized pretty much all the knowledge of, you know, about bed bugs um, up until 2007. So this is a great book to have for any school district or for the health department. Um, and then here's this new publication that I found. This one's free online. And really, it, it summarizes all the, the recent research from 2007 on. Um, it was published, I think, at the end of last spring. So this is a 2010 publication. Um, and this is really good. And a lot of this stuff I have in my talk came directly from this publication. So if you're thinking about doing bed bug treatments or you want um, some knowledge to, to give advice to people, definitely give this a read. Um, OK. OK. So I, I have. I kind of want to talk about how to create a comprehensive bed bug management plan for schools. So if you've already written one, that's great. Uh, maybe you'll get some new ideas from this presentation. Um, and these are just some things I came up with reading the North Carolina, the, North Carolina, the state of North Carolina just came up with a, a bed bug um, action plan for, for schools. And I took some of this information from there. Um, so like you said, if it's already been written, why not use it? Um, so. A lot of that came from there. But, but here are the critical things. Early detection and district-wide training of employees. Prevention, is, prevention is, is pretty important. Early detection, I think, is the most important aspect of bed bug control by far. Um, preparedness, district-wide response for bed bug reports. Find a re you know, how to find a reputable, reputable pest control company. Um, if, you, you know, if you don't have in-house pest control, there are some things you should look for in a company um, concerning bed bug control. And then developing your own control strategy. I'm going to cover the pros and cons of all available bed bug treatments, you know, to date, I think. So anyway, bed bug biology. So the first thing is, is, you know, where do bed bugs come from? I think probably everybody in this room wasn't around when, you know, or has never experienced bed bugs in their lifetime until now. Am I right? Or, yeah, unless you're really super old. Um, anyway. So, so what happened? So here's the history. Um, so scientists believe that this began probably over 30,000 years ago with cavemen. You know, our, our ancestors, they're living in caves, but what also lives in caves? Bats, of course, right? And so bat bugs probably existed before bed bugs. Um, and we still have bat bugs today. They're the other most common non-target submissive or bed bug family that I see at the lab. Yeah. 
Um, they, I don't know about um, molting, but as far as reproduction goes, bat bugs can't reproduce on human blood. They cannot. cannot. So th th that's the positive side. I'll talk about it um, in a couple minutes. But anyway, so we had these bat bugs um, there, and of course, you know, maybe they drop down off the bats or climb down the cave walls and feed on humans. And over time, they became able to reproduce on human blood, and maybe in some cases, they became their preferred host. So eventually, we left the caves, moved out into our you know, agrarian society, and of course, we brought with us bed bugs. Why not? Um, so they've really been afflicting us for you know, as far back as man goes. But the, early, the earliest recorded history of bed bugs, um, use this one, um, the earliest recorded was actually in Egypt, and they had actually Solomon hieroglyphs, amazingly enough. And that's 3000 BC. And then throughout time, you know, they moved north into Greece and into Italy. And then by about 1500, they were definitely up in, up in, uh, you know, the, in Europe or in um, the UK region. England, I guess is what I want to say. Um, they were up in England. Um, and it was believed that, you know, back in the 1500s, about one third of every household had bed bugs. You know, pretty much everywhere. And maybe we're on that same trajectory today. But of course, this is about the same time that people began coming to the Americas. Um, and when they came across, of course, on their ships, they brought with them bed bugs because they hitch along on everything. So from, you know, 1600s up until the 1930s, bed bug populations were just increasing. So it eventually reached a point where in the United States in the 1920s and 30s that we had, you know, one of every three homes infested with bed bugs. You could pick them up at the movie theater, you could pick them up on the subway, on the buses, pretty much anywhere you can think of with a common space, you could pick up bed bugs. So, why don't we know about bed bugs and why haven't we heard of them until recently? Um, well, the reason is, is in the 40s, they came up with these, these great chemicals, um, you know, maybe not great for birds and things like that, but certainly these did the job when it came to bed bug and roach control. Of course, DDT, everybody's heard of that. If you spray this around a home, you know, it has a residual period of months up to a year. And, and by residual period, I mean, you know, once that stuff dries, it can continue to kill insects, you know, for months to years. So that's, that's pretty much what happened. We had the developed world using these, these long residual chemicals, and we pretty much wiped bed bugs off the face of the developed world. Um, but of course, you know, bed bugs weren't gone completely. They were harboring in other areas around the world. So really, it was only a matter of time before they began to spread. So why are they on the rise? We can't say for certain, but here are the ideas. Um, so these chemicals right here, DDT, lindane, chlordane, they're no longer legal to use in the United States. And these have you know, the longest residual of any products. Um, so we're not allowed to use these anymore. Malathion, we still use this in an agricultural setting, but it's definitely not allowed for indoor use. Um, so we don't really have many chemicals at our disposal for treating bed bugs these days. So they think that's part of the reason. The other reason is, you know, I mentioned that bed bugs are pushed back into refugia around the world. And as travel began to increase, you know, now we have planes and things like that. It's only a matter of time before people started spreading them around. And then they're popular, you know, they start here somewhere, they fly over here, the population builds here, somebody else picks them up, takes them here, and you can see how things have been building. And this isn't a new phenomena. I mean, the media just picked this up recently, and it's, it's their new hot topic. But um, bed bugs have been on the rise in the United States um, for about a decade now. We just haven't heard about it until recently. Because they, their populations, they kind of have an exponential growth. You know, they start out kind of slow, and then boom, they eventually hit this curve that goes straight up where the populations are booming. Um, so that's probably what's happening now. Po there are little populations all over the country now, and they're more frequently being encountered and, and transmitted around. Um, what about some other things? Ricardo mentioned earlier that if your school hasn't had bed bugs, it's only a matter of time before they will. And we, we talked briefly about uh, websites online where people can report re um, bed bug sightings from different hotels. Well, th this is one I, I took a screenshot of from um, bedbugregistry.com. Um, and, and like you said, you don't know how valid these reports are, how severe the infestation is. But nevertheless, some of these have to be actual reports. So you can see, it, at the least, there are bed bug populations right around Salt Lake City here. 
It only takes, you know, somebody to bring one over to the school, you know, for you to have a problem. Um, and I'm sure that the health, uh, you know, the, the health department has had numerous reports too, right? Yeah. How, how many would you say? Hundreds? So at least, at least there are hundreds, you know, in this area that aren't even on this map. So they're close. It's just a matter of when, when are they going to get here. Um, so it's just a matter of time. Um, another reason they're on the rise, what, what about these industries here? Here's a picture I took. It's a company in, in Ohio. And Ohio is one of the kind of the, the focus points right now of bed bug outbreak. But here's a company that refurbishes mattresses. So they, they, go to, they go to these dumps, they pull the mattresses out and refurbish them. Um, so unless they're certified to not have bed bugs, you never know what they're doing. They could just be you know, putting new cloth on top and not even inspecting for bed bugs. You go and buy a refurbished mattress, bring it home, now you have a problem. Um, you know, I'm not picking on this company in particular, but uh, just thrift stores in general, you know, that used to be a good place to go buy used furniture or anything. And it's not just beds. If somebody had a severe infestation at their home and they brought maybe their stereo equipment or something in, that could have bed bugs in it. So now you've got to be very cautious about you know, where you're purchasing your items, you know, garage sales, thrift stores, just be weary and do a very thorough inspection before you bring anything into your house. Um, so, and then the, like, like these, rental these rental truck companies, you know, what if the person who moved before you had a severe bed bug infestation and they threw all their stuff in that truck and some bed bugs crawled out into the truck, then you go and rent this thing um, and maybe they crawl back into your stuff. So keep that in mind. Like I said, I'm like a worst case scenario person. Um, but this also happens maybe for mattress companies. If mattress companies are in the business of taking the old mattresses away, you know, they could be infesting their trucks too. So keep that in mind when you buy a mattress. Um, common rooms. Within a school, there are common rooms, you know, locker rooms, maybe libraries or lounges, areas where there are couches or you know, where a lot of people are in close proximity or their belongings are in close proximity. One person brings in bed bugs to a couch or maybe a locker and they could easily spread to other lockers and then you have numerous people transmitting bed bugs all around. You know, same old story. And finally, uh, we have this poor recognition. Again, we didn't grow up with bed bugs. We don't know what they look like. Um, so now we know what they look like. I'll get into it in more detail. But more importantly, people wake up with these, these marks on them and they don't know what caused it. They just assume they were bitten by something random, but they wouldn't assume bed bugs necessarily. So you, you have to be able to identify what the, what the bite symptoms look like. So if you see a child with something like that on them and they're scratching, you know, that's cause for suspicion. Yeah. So are each one of those red marks a bite? Yeah. Wouldn't it be caused by the same bug? Or it could be. It, you know. I'll talk about it. All of your questions will be answered. Is your blood different? No, I mean, I, I think it has to do, do with uh, how juicy the blood vessel is and how close to the surface of your skin it is because they, they're kind of focusing in on heat. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure the vessels are a little bit warmer than ambient skin. Um, so, anyway, yeah, somehow they find those blood vessels that are close to the surface. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk more about the, the feeding habits in a little bit. Okay.